This episode, I'm joined by Julian Cripp, who is an author, journalist, editor, and science communicator. He is the author of numerous books, including Surviving the 21st Century and Food or War. In this episode, we discuss the existential threats facing humanity and how to solve them, alongside discussions on democracy, food quality, climate change, and more. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support Hermetics Podcast or become part of the community, please find links in the description below. Enjoy. So, Julian Cribb, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. You're welcome. Um, we're going to be discussing, well, with the conversation is going to be around climate change and the problems that we're going to be facing in the next 50 to 100 years, if not sooner, um, largely coming from your book, Surviving the 21st Century, Humanity's 10 Great Challenges and How We Can Overcome Them, which I believe was published in 2016. Um, but you're the author of many other books, I believe is your latest food, Food or War? That's correct, yes. Yeah. Um, so hopefully we'll touch on you know why, why food is such an important thing for you in terms of how we're going in the future. Um, but before we get going, for those who don't know your work, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what did you do and how you came to uh, how you came to be writing books such as these? Yeah, well, I've been a newspaper editor and a science writer most of my career. Been writing about science and agriculture and things like that for about fifty years now. Uh, so I've seen a lot of change and I've seen a lot of technology come down the line. Uh, and you can't help drawing some conclusions about where this is all going to end up. Especially, I have been privileged to interview thousands of different scientists about their particular specialties, where the world is going in their particular areas and so on. And uh, it really came to me that I ought to be writing this stuff in a way that ordinary people can can understand, a non-technical, simple way of explaining the dilemma that the human species is now in. Um, We're facing an existential emergency. And and that emergency consists of 10 enormous threats, which are all bearing down on us together. There's not just one or two, there's 10 of them. And we have to fix them all. And that's what I really write about, how how we go about fixing those threats. Mm -hmm. So as you interviewed so many scientists, do you you think there's um, some areas of science that are overlooked in terms of, you know, our future? Yeah, science is like a jigsaw puzzle, you know. There, There are thousands of pieces. Uh, and they, they have to be fitted together in order to form the big picture. And the beauty of science is that individual scientists focus very much on one or two or ten pieces, just a little bit of that picture. Um, the fortune of being a science communicator or a, a science journalist is that I can assemble the larger picture because I've spoken to people in so many different disciplines and I'm able to see that big picture and share it with uh, a much wider audience. How how come in journalism that was the area you, you went to? I know that's probably a long time ago since uh, since you sort of made that decision, but can you remember why it was that you were so attracted to this, you know, uh, journalism of, of science of this perspective? Yeah, it was about 30 years ago, but uh, I, I'd spent around about 20, the previous 20 years writing about food and agriculture, and I felt I'd pretty well been there, done that. Um, I still write about it. I'm still interested in it, but I I didn't want to stay there the rest of my life. And I was working for, uh, I was offered a job on the national daily newspaper in Australia. And uh, and they said, what do you want to write about? And I said, well, I want to write about science because there is always something new in science. But if you write about politics or economics, uh, you get the same old story coming around again and again and again, every five, 10 years, same story, different people. Um, so, you know, history repeats itself in that sense. Science never does. Science is always about something new, something inspiring, something uh, awesome, something uh, frightening. Um, but it's a very exciting field to write about. So you said that, you know, with politics, history repeats itself. Do you think with science that it isn't science itself, but actually the reaction to it that repeats itself, our ignorance? Oh, yeah. Our society repeats itself in terms of... <laughs> It's responses to science, you know, we're as frightened of science now as we were back in the dark ages. Um, You know, nothing much changes in that regard. But science is always discovering new things and deepening its understanding of the world we live in. Science is a constant process of revision. You know, we're, we're, we're reinterpreting the world all the time. It's not fixed. 
It, it's not the way we believe it to be. The world is, is incredibly complex and science gives us new insights all the time. And we have to adjust our understanding of it. And we have to adjust our understanding of the threats that surround us as well. So before we jump into uh, the next set of questions, which are you know more deeply in, in, in line with the conversation that we've been having, I do have to ask you the hermetics question, uh, which you've given me the answers to, which is sort of a fourth as well, if we include uh, the one who you removed. Uh, but you can place three thinkers living or dead into a room and listen in on the conversation. Who do you pick? Well, I thought um, probably Jim Hansen, who's the guy who really laid the groundwork for the climate debate. Uh, he was the bloke who looked up at Venus and said, I wonder how it got to be 400 degrees in the shade. And uh, when, he, when he wondered that, he, uh, you know, he realised that it could happen to the Earth as well if we, if we uh, fill the atmosphere with too much carbon dioxide. Um, then I think, you know, I'd, I'd go for someone like David Attenborough, you know, because he's such a wise man, speaks so beautifully. Like me, he's a journalist who has seen many, many things and talk to many, many scientists. He's got an enormously broad experience of life and the planet. And uh, I guess he's, he's a walking encyclopedia of nature and what we're doing to it, you know, and how dangerous that is for us. So, so he would be one. And then just to throw in uh, a, a, a completely uh, random name, I would go for Jacinda Ardern, the, the Prime Minister of New Zealand because she is a leader who is showing the new style of leadership that is desperately needed worldwide to bring ourselves to face the realities of these challenges that confront us uh, and to think our way through them and to solve the problems. All the other re leaders have got their heads in the sand, as far as I'm concerned. I can't think of one big country that is led by somebody who really understands all the issues. And I include America with its latest change in that particular thing. The, the leaders do not see into the future. They see to the next election uh, or the next political punctuation mark. They do not look into the future for the next generation and the generations to come. So Jacinda is, is, is different. And I, I would like her take on how we get the polity, the, the society, to embrace these issues, to embrace the change that they are bringing with them. In what, in what practical way do you see um, Jacinda as different? Well, she, she recognises the threats, for one thing, uh, and, and that's, not all leaders do that, especially from my country, Australia. Um, she is a, she's a woman, you know, and, and she doesn't seek confrontation. She seeks understanding, communion, shared points of view. She's always looking, her solution to a problem is to embrace other people um, and, and to try to take them with her. Uh, and I mean, it's been noticeable to me, New Zealand's ma managed the COVID thing very well. She always deferred to her expert, you know, medicos on COVID. She never tried to jump over the top of them, as so many leaders did, and say, hey, this is what we should be doing, guys. She always deferred to the experts. And, and consequently, she got very good advice. She listened to the experts and she listens to her people. She's a listener. Leaders have to be listeners. A lot of them are talkers. They, they blab, they blab forever and ever, but they do not listen. Uh, so I think that she's a quite a different mold of leader. She's the kind of leader that the world needs. We need women to lead this world, not men. For the, if we are to survive as a species, we need women as leaders. Why, why do you think there's a, an importance of it being a being a woman? Do you just think that those traits will will come with women as opposed to men being a bit more uh, hostile towards things? Well. Let me put it this way. How many wars <clears throat> can you name that, that were started by women? How many wars can you name that were started by men? Mm -hmm. Men like to solve their problems with brutal simplicity using machines, poisons, and weapons, right? And they do not care about the consequences. As long as they kill the bug or get rid of the enemy or whatever it is, they've solved the problem. They, they do not look at what is coming down. Women look into the future because, you know, they are thinking about the next generation and the generation after it. So <clears throat> women naturally, you know, they, they do not seek confrontation um, and aggression in the same way that men do. Now, aggression was fine when we were in the Stone Age. Maybe it was okay in the 19th century. 
we learned in the 20th century it's a bloody unproductive activity and and we killed you know we killed 200 million people in pointless wars in the, in the last 150 years all those wars were started by men they were mostly fought by men um, and to be honest with you what what did they achieve uh, other than a lot of very unproductive things and a lot of dead people so we need a different style of leadership we need women as leaders and we need men who think like women you know who, who look into the future and say ah this is what is happening i know what we can do to avoid a tragedy and that is called wisdom wisdom is the art of looking into the future identifying a threat and working out how you can solve it in the best possible way okay so jump to, jumping back to what you were saying about some leaders are talkers and some are listeners who are planning do you think then that many of these new you know the I'm thinking of the Green New Deal and uh, what's the latest one? The the Great Reset. Are these to you just sort of veils, which are you know they're using all the words which sound right, like sustainable and ecologically friendly, but really these are sort of veils just to keep the the, the status quo going for their own benefit. A lot of people don't want to change. Um, human beings are naturally conservative, and we're conservative for a good biological reason that we like to cling to that which we know to be safe and reliable and trustworthy. But when we have to change, we have to change. And obviously, there's a lot of big industries, big businesses, uh, vested interests and so on that are utterly opposed to change. We're now starting to have the debate, how do we bring these people with us? We can't leave them behind, except perhaps the coal industry and the oil industry. Uh, we'll be glad to leave them behind. But but most of them, have, they've got, at least the people have got to come with us. So the, the language that you talk about is, is the language of economics, obviously, and the language of management and, and so on. How, how, do we, how do we redefine the way we talk about our society, um, its economic existence and so on, in order to take all these people with us? I think the Green New Deal is a way of explaining the need to change to people who are naturally reluctant to change. Um, and, and likewise, you know, the, the reset and, and things. These are terms that have been developed by the World Economic Forum, if you like, and, of course, the United States uh, Democrat Party and so forth. They're all trying to move enormous numbers of people to a different way of thought. And it's a very difficult thing to do because humans do not move easily en masse. No, no. it's interesting... You, you mentioned that we're naturally conservative because obviously, you know, that does make sense in terms of trying to stay alive, which is something that you, you bring up right at the beginning of the um, surviving the 21st century. You say our quintessential wisdom is the wisdom of the survivor. You know, we're a species that understands that we need to survive. We're conscious of the fact. And it's strange then that this conservatism has sort of been turned on its head that we're trying to conserve the thing which is actually going to eventually destroy us. We're trying to conserve, you know, uh, using more resources than we actually have because we love to have stuff, right? But what do you, what do you, you know, what artificial structures there do you think have been made which actually allows us to, to think in a way which will bring about our own demise? And not even that, we try to vindicate that as well. Well, the, the dilemma has arisen. Uh, I mean, con the consumption that we have today, which, which everyone uh, is starting to decry and so on, that would not be a problem if the earth still had the same number of people on it as it did when I was born. That is a bit over 2 billion people, right? But we've got nearly 8 billion people now, and we're going to 10 or 11 billion people. So when you've got that many people all demanding resources, you know, water, soil, you know, timber, metals, materials of all kinds, uh, you, you've got the makings of a tragedy. That is what has changed. It has been the explosion in the human population, a fourfold increase in the last 70 years in the human population, and you know a, a sixfold increase in the size of its demands on the planet. You put those two things together, and you can see why we are running, why we are running out of planet. You know, and and we've got to change those things. So it's no good being conservative now. We can't go on behaving as if this was 1940. Uh, it's, it's utterly pointless because, because there's, there's nearly 8 billion of us. 
And if, if we did that, we would come unstuck very quickly. So we, we have to change our behaviours fairly radically to encompass this new reality that there is just too many of us. So do, do you believe we have to change our consumption behaviours or our reproductive behaviours? All of the above. Um, let me talk about them separately. Consumption is easy. Uh, we, we can fix consumption simply by creating a circular economy. In other words, we recycle everything. Then, then we never run out. If we recycle all our timber, you know, we'll never run out of timber. If we recycle all our metals, we'll never run out of metals. If every time you have a, a mobile phone, you take it back to the shop and swap it for a new one and the metals get recycled by the maker, that's fine. You're never going to run out of those rare earth minerals and things like that. Um, water, you know, we'll never run out of water if we recycle it, but we don't. We, we fill it full of pollution and then we tip it in the ocean. So that's why we're running out of water. Um, let's talk about population a moment, right? Now, population is in fact starting to, to come down. The, the peak of human population, if we're lucky, will be reached in the 2060s. And the reason for that is that the women of the world, and again, this is women as leaders, have halved their birth rates, okay? They've halved their fertility. They've gone from 4.4 children each down to 2.3 children each. And by the 2050s, they're going to be below 2.1, which is below replacement. So the, 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 the human population can start very slowly to come down from the 2060s onwards. Against that, you have to take into account the fact that we're living longer lives, and that keeps the human population inflated at a larger level than it would otherwise be. If we all live to, to 85 instead of to 55, as we used to do, uh, then obviously we're, we're, we're occupying resources and so forth for the rest of our lives. But nevertheless, the human population can start to come down. And if we have fewer governments who are bribing their citizens to have more babies. You know, if we, if, if we get rid of this, 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 this growth mantra that we have in economics and society and politics, um, you know, more people is not, is not better. It's actually much worse. The living standards of our children are going to be worse than ours because we have overpopulated. So we, we've got to start realising that and we've got to start putting the brakes on it. And I'm glad to say that the women of the world have already shown clear leadership in that regard. Without asking male permission, they are lowering the human population. Is there a, is there a scientific understanding as to why fertility rates or uh, reproductive rates have gone down, or, or is that a, a purely social phenomenon? The, 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 the pat explanation is that if you provide women with education, um, uh, health, uh, health care, uh, opportunities in life, opportunities to have a career and things like that, they naturally have fewer babies. And especially if they're babies, they can be sure that their babies are going to survive. So as every country comes up the living standard curve, when it hits about 2000 US dollars per head, the birth rate just takes a dive, basically. So as people achieve a certain level of prosperity where those things are guaranteed, where women have the option uh, to lead their own life, to have a career, to have fewer children or no children. Um, and then, you know, th that, that just happens naturally. But I also like to think that we are thinking as a species. Uh, it's noticeable that after World War II, there was a baby boom, all right? People were so horrified at the 60 million people who lost their lives in that short five-year period uh, that they automatically went out and had babies. Now, I like to think that what is happening now is a population bust led by women who are reacting autonomously, each one taking her own individual decision, but part of a much greater decision by the species to head off absolute unmitigated disaster. So, you know, the, the other side of the population question then is obviously having less babies, but also people are living longer lives. But there's, I don't, I'm not sure you, if you'd agree, but I certainly see a sort of cult of longevity obviously people want to live the longest life they can but it seems that there is actually a push towards living quite literally as long as you possibly can even often to the detriment of your to of your quality of life do you do you think that that's harmful in a way that that idea that you know even if we're just alive we should just keep going for the for the sake of it look uh 
every life is lived at the expense of somebody else. You know, it, it doesn't matter what you do. I mean, if you if you release fossil fuels in the course of your life, you're poisoning some someone else somewhere else. You know, so so we're all harming other people. Um, yes, we're a selfish species, and we look out for number one first. And if, you know, if we can live an extra five years, you know, we don't really care about the people who are going to go hungry or starve or suffer diseases and things like that. We are a selfish species. But look, if you have um, if you have the option of, of voluntary euthanasia, so that you don't have to live, you know, into an impossible old age when you're just a, a huge burden on the state and on your family and so forth, uh, that's that's one way of of, of easing that. Um, and we can physically reduce our demands on the planet as we age. And one of the things you learn as you get older, you become wiser, is to use less stuff. You know, we don't go out and buy things quite like you do when you're a teenager. So you think you think there needs to be sort of a, a rebirth of an understanding that we can actually repair things. This is something that dawned on me the other day. I think consumer society has actually made it almost impossible unless you you undertake it yourself which is which is rare now auto didactism is is fairly rare unless you undertake it yourself there's no such thing as repair shops anymore it's almost always cheaper to go and buy a new thing doing you know i think perhaps it's almost obvious that we need a a, a restatement of a repair uh, ethos well, when I grew up, there was always a cobbler's shop on the high street repairing your shoes, and you took them in there once every few months and got new soles put on them. Yeah, <clears throat> that, that's completely gone. Um, and, and we've got this throwaway society. But don't blame the consumers entirely. The throwaway society has been inculcated by greedy manufacturers who wanted to sell us more shoes, who wanted to sell maximum amounts of goods, and they wanted us to throw them away and then buy more and more and more. So we've got ourselves into a very bad, wasteful and stupid place because not only are we wasting resources, we're also poisoning ourselves. I mean, the, the amount of stuff that is produced now, it all leaves a toxic footprint. The chemicals that are used to produce it, the, the minerals that are dislodged when you mine for the, the raw materials. Even when you grow food, you leave a toxic footprint. So you know, the, the act of consumption is a fairly toxic one and, and we have to do something about that. <clears throat> I'm not sure how, how true this is, but I believe there's a few countries now that have outlawed uh, built-in obsolescence. Yeah, I'm not sure where, where that is. Um, trouble is you've got transnational corporations and they are, for the most part, bigger than most governments on earth. Okay, They're, they're much larger economic entities than most governments. So they can just you know turn up their nose at, at any individual government, <clears throat> they can take their business offshore, they can ignore it, uh, or like the coal and the oil industry, they can lobby to corrupt the politicians so that the politicians support them and not the interests of the community or the nation. So you, you see, unfortunately, we've got a system now where, where politics is heavily corrupted by transnational corporations. Uh, and we've got the transnational corporations are the ones who need educating. And the only people who can educate them are consumers. That's what I was going to say is, you know, a lot of people will feel sort of overwhelming defeat when you say something like that. So, you know, in what sense do you think that, the, you know, the, the individual everyday consumer who's just going about their daily life can actually affect the, the decisions and the actions of these, you know, le Leviathan-like uh, transnational corporations? Yeah, well, one of our more corrupt coal companies in Australia went broke yesterday. Um, why did this? Why did this happen? Uh, the answer is that people went out and bought solar arrays and stuck them on their roofs, and they're shopping for electric cars, and they just don't want this old stuff called coal any longer. That's consumers voting with their wallets, you know, for a better product, a product that is clean, green, healthy, safe. Uh, and renewable. And if consumers do that with food, if they do that with their clothing, if they do it with the cosmetics and personal care products that they wear, if they do it with their furniture and so on in their house, you know, they, they shop clean and green. They can change the behavior of the biggest corporations on earth. Okay. So <clears throat> the big question, I mean, for you, you outline it very clearly. You, you state that this is an existential 
risk. This is a potential, would you say it's a potential extinction event? Yes, if we get it wrong. I mean, if, for example, the climate really cooks up because we have unleashed the, the methane, the methane that is currently locked in the bottom of the oceans, in the tundra and in the tropical um, swamps, if that goes up into the atmosphere, we will cook the planet, we'll go to 10 degrees, not, not a shadow of a doubt. And that's just unsurvivable for human beings. But in the process of getting to 10 degrees, we'll have lots and lots of famines and wars and pandemics. So, uh, And some of those wars will be nuclear. So it depends how many nukes we let off as to whether we exterminate human beings or not. Um, if you let off more than uh, more than a hundred nuclear weapons, you throw up such a large cloud of ash and dust uh, that you you shade the sun, and you suddenly find that all around the world you can't grow crops any longer as easily as you once could. So there is a worldwide famine. So even if the war was on the other side of the earth, you know, uh, you could still have a famine in North America and a famine in Europe. Um, so you wouldn't be protected from that. So there, there are huge risks like that in the background now. More and more people are, are adopting this, you know, are arming themselves with, with high technology nuclear weapons, killer robots and the like. So the risk of any major dispute between different countries or groups of people uh, leading to a nuclear war is much higher now than it's been at any time since the Cold War and probably higher than then. Okay, <clears throat> so as a as a species, we're sort of becoming globally conscious of this potential extinction event, which is tied in with you know natural causes, technological causes, and then social uh, you know disruption as well. So you know the big question for me is faced with this, and and many of us are conscious of it now. Why why do you think, as someone who's worked in this field for so long, and obviously interviewed so many people working within this field? Why do you think as a species, perhaps not all of us, but many of us, are still so utterly ignorant and pig-headed or, and almost consciously ignorant? We don't want to even admit to this, even though it could kill every one of us, potentially. Yeah, well, belief is a very strong thing. I mean, even though belief has absolutely no foundation, I mean, the definition of the word belief means something for which there is no evidence. Um but it's a, it's a very strong thing. It's part of our evolutionary background. There is a biological reason that we have beliefs, but we have to understand that they are nearly always wrong. Um, and so, it, but it makes us very reluctant to change the way we do things if we do not see a need to change. I mean, when push comes to shove, you know, and and World War Two breaks out and things like that, you have to change. You've got no choice. So you just you you, you stiff up a lip, you get on with it. Um, but at the moment, people obviously are resistant to it. And of course, people who've got money invested in not changing, people who've got money in coal or oil or gas or those sorts of things, obviously do not want us to change. And they're spending an awful lot of time and money ensuring that our parliaments don't let us change. So, uh, you know, the, the, there is a, an awful lot of pushback coming, coming down the line here. And that means that the catastrophe, when it comes, is going to be a lot bigger than it needed to be. And that's, that's the point. Uh, I think people change when they're, when they're confronted with the inevitable, right? when they see that there is absolutely no alternative, they have to change. But by that stage, it is too flaming late and it's going to cost a lot of lives. And that's really why, why I'm writing my books, and, and there's five of them now, is to give people as much warning, science-based warning, as possible so that they can make the changes in their own lives and their families' lives and things before it gets to that ir irretrievable situation. Do you, think that, <clears throat> do you think, you know, where do you stand on that debate? Do you think well, we're going to change before or do you think it is going to be, you know, knock, knock, here's, here's the event, you have to deal with it? Well, I wrote my books because... As a science writer, I was meeting more and more scientists who were studying particular aspects of this, like climate, and they were very depressed people. They were all saying, I think we've had it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I said to myself, I wonder if they're right. I don't know whether they're right. I, I'm just a civilian here. I, I, I don't know whether. But I, I then realised that what I could do is I could delve into the best of the science, talk to the best scientists, read the best scientific literature, 
uh, interrogate the best institutions and so on and see what they collectively were saying about these 10 mega risk areas. And, and I mean, that's my main contribution to this, that there is not one risk. It's not about climate, you know, or extinction or something like that. There are 10 of them. And they are all the result of human action or activity. And they are all coming together at the same time. And you have to fix all of them at the same time. Because if you don't, if you fix climate and nothing else, we're still doomed, you know, because the, all the other things will take us out. You know, nukes will still take us out. We've got to fix nuclear weapons. You know, we, we, we've got to fix the food problem. You know, we've got to fix the poisoning problem. Um, so the best way to do it is, is, to, is to tackle them all together and come up with solutions that make none of them worse. Mm -hmm. But of these 10, though, obviously you've written a specific book, Food or War. Um, you know, why is food for you, is that one that you see almost as a catalyst which can begin to spiral other things, you know, out of control? I mean, there is that um, sort of infamous statistic that um, every, what is it, five, five meals away from, I can't remember, I think it comes from Spain, and it, any society is five meals away from sort of disorder, I think it is? Yeah, there are only seven meals seven. between civilization and anarchy. Yeah, and, and the Spanish would know all about that because they've had plenty of cases of anarchy in their in their long history. <clears throat> so, and, and, and this is true in, in many societies. I wrote the book because there is a conventional view in academia that wars lead to famines. And it was pretty obvious to me from my reading of history and my own studies that there are a lot of famines that began with wars or a lot of wars that began with famines. So, so it, it, it works both ways, basically. If you want to avoid um, a, a war, the best way to do it is make sure everyone is fed because if you do that, it lowers the tensions. When people have not got enough to eat, they get very angry with one another and they divide along cultural or political or religious lines and then they get stuck into one another, like the Tutsi and the Hutu in Rwanda. You know, all of in the last 40 years or so, two-thirds of all the wars that have been fought worldwide began in a quarrel over food, land, and water. Those three, they are the three essentials for survival. No society can survive without them. So basically, if you take those away or you destabilize those, people are very likely to fight. So the French Revolution begins with a famine. The Russian Revolution begins with a famine. World War II starts because Hitler wants to take the Russian grain belt. That was the German war aim. Primary German war aim in World War II was to capture the Russian grain belt and put German farmers on it and feed, feed Germany from Russia. That, that was what he was all about, actually. If you read Mein Kampf and, and the things he said in the media long before he rose to fame, um, that, that's, that's what he was after. So, in other words, food is a trigger for human conflict. But let me flip that around. If you have enough food, you also have a dearth of conflict, right? If you feed Africa, you're going to have much fewer of the wars like the Sudanese War, the Horn of Africa, you know, the, the Rwanda crisis. All of these things began in a fight over land and cattle and water and stuff like that. So, so you, if you can feed everybody, no problem. You just, you've de-escalated the tensions and people are much likely, less likely to, to come to blows. So in food or war, basically I say, is the current food system sustainable? Short answer is no, it's not, because climate, soil loss and water scarcity are going to screw the food system that we've got today. Okay, what's a food system like that, that would be sustainable? And I describe a sustainable food system for the earth. And then where's the money going to come from? Well, the short answer is you take it out of the military budget. Now, there's $1.8 trillion being squandered every year on useless buddy weapons and things like that. If you took 20% of that, you could feed everybody on Earth and you could actually prevent two-thirds of all wars. So, so food is the key to world peace. And, and, and so if we put some of our – if we see food as a, as a weapon of defense, a weapon of peace – and we put some of our military spending into food instead of better rockets and, and things like that, you actually remove the need for the rockets. Uh, what about the sort of contemporary trends, especially in the Western world, towards alternative diets, such as uh, 
you know, primarily undertaken for the sake of, uh, you know, ecological benefits such as, you know, veganism or sustainable diets or organic diets, are these all thwarted in the face of the things you mentioned, the water scarcity and the, the you know, the soil quality, etc.? Well, the trouble is, um, America developed uh, around about World War II and just after, it developed a new model of agriculture, which was based on the Henry Ford model of industrial production. You know, everything was force fed. Uh, through uh, an enormous industrial combine, basically. And this form of agriculture is not sustainable in the long run. It has too many chemicals. It does too much damage to the soil. It doesn't conserve water. It's got a whole lot of things wrong with it. It's going to fall over. As soon as the climate gets bad, it's going to fall over. So it's already falling over. In fact, there are droughts all around the world with climate change. So um, we need a different system. And and that's called regenerative agriculture. And that's a much more, you know, th that's like what's been practiced at Rothamsted Research Station in the UK um, and, and, and so on for, for 100 years. Um, it's, it's a way that you, you take care of the water, the soil, the, the microbes in the soil, the crops, the animals, the whole thing is, is, is it all fits together. So when people put forward their, their idea of the ideal diet, what I don't really like about this is that they tend to lecture people and they say, oh, you must become a vegan. Well, if you do that, you take animals out of the equation and you make agriculture much less sustainable. If everybody becomes a vegan, then they're just going to eat vegetables grown with chemicals. You know, that's a, that's a pretty nasty diet. Um, so, so we actually do need a complex food system. But let me say this. If you went into the biggest market on earth, um, it could be Amsterdam or somewhere like that, you would find around about 200 to 300 different plants on sale there. That is the total quantum of what human beings now eat. But get this, there are 30,000 edible plants on planet Earth. So the industrial farming system that we've got is focusing on less than 1% of the edible plants on the planet. You know, what a stupid stupid system that is, you know, and, and it's turned those things into very unhealthy. The, the, the modern diet is an extremely unhealthy diet. It kills between two thirds and three quarters of its consumers. I mean, they, they die of a diet related disease, like heart disease, cancer, diabetes, you know, you name it. Um, so, so, you know, two thirds, three quarters of Britons, three quarters of Australians, three quarters of Americans are now dying of food related diseases. So this is clearly not a good diet, even though it's very cheap to produce. But it's it's rubbish basically, and and we need to we need to go back to regenerative agriculture. We need to start producing food in our cities, right? London at the moment cannot produce enough food to feed itself. It couldn't feed itself for a day, basically. But if if London was turned into a food production centre. It could feed the entire British Isles by recycling its water, by recycling its nutrients. <laughs> you know, if you if you grew plants on the roofs, if you grew them in biocultures and things like that, you could produce a phenomenal amount of food from, from a big city like London. And at the moment, there's not one city on earth that can feed itself, not one. They all have to get their food from thousands of miles away, very long chains, producing an awful lot of carbon and a lot of waste and a lot of pollution. You know, why not just grow it on the spot or at least half of it on the spot by recycling? Again, we come back to the circular economy idea, recycling your water and your nutrients. Don't just throw them away. Use them again. Use them again. And, and then we will have a sustainable system. And the other thing we can do because we've, we've pillaged the oceans. We've emptied them of wild fish, basically. That Chinese fleet that we all saw off the Galapagos a, a couple of months ago, you know, hundreds and hundreds of fishing boats attacking this one little area, they will empty the oceans of, of wild fish uh, within, within five or ten years. The, the, the world fish catch is collapsing at the, as we speak. But if you began to farm the deep oceans, for example, take all those nasty old oil rigs that are no more use any longer because we don't need oil. But if you turn them into centres of deep ocean aquaculture, uh, basically you, you can produce a third of the world's food of, in, in, in the form of water plants and fish and other marine organisms. 
So, you know, those three are the basis of a sustainable food system. So urban food, deep ocean aquaculture, and regenerative farming are on the best land around the world. <clears throat> it's funny you mentioned, um, you know, the fact that we only use 200, 200 plants in that it, it, I read an essay a while back about sort of contemporary biophobia, you know, the, the, the phobia of biology in terms of people are, people deem it sort of weird now to go foraging or to eat these other plants. Do you, do you think there's a certain sense of what is, you know, in quotation marks, normal to eat, especially in the West, is really hindering our ability to, you know, utilize all the nutrients and resources that are, are actually available to us? We are not eating the stuff that is good for us. Uh, or the stuff that we would even particularly like to eat. We are only eating what we are being told to eat by the 20 vast corporations that dominate the world food trade. Those big supermarket chains, industrial food processors, the, the grain giants and so on, they are the people who decide which grains you are going to eat. Now, not not the, the tens of thousands of different grains that are available to eat, which our ancestors ate, uh, but but the five or six grains that they have decided are easy to process and manufacture into you know crisps or something or other. So so you know our diet is being dictated by a handful, a tiny handful of people sitting around twenty boardroom tables. Right, our diet is being decided for us by about two hundred people, and we don't have any real say. We think we've got choice, but we haven't. It's the same old crap, just in different disguises. Do you think this is primarily a Western issue, as in you know the Western world, or because not really? Because no. we've infected Asia. They, they, they've got supermarketitis as well. They've got large industry. They've copied the American Chinese. Have copied the Americans. Uh, the Chinese China is the biggest producer of toxic pesticides on the planet now. They've, they've taken over the pesticides industry from America and from Europe, and they are now mass producing these things. And the amount of pesticide in the Chinese food supply is terrifying, right? It's poisoning every single Chinese every day. Even the small amount that is in our diet is poisoning us. But, but there is a phenomenal amount of this stuff. I mean, there's, there's five um, million tons of highly toxic substances are used to grow the world's food every single year. And those things are not called back and they don't all break down. They go on doing harm. So, you know, we're, we're putting out 10 times the amount of stuff that we were putting out when Rachel Carson wrote The Silent Spring in 1962. I guess listeners might thank me for this, but, you know, there's, you've mentioned a lot about the pesticides and the chemicals that are poisoning us. Is there an actual, on an individual level, is there a way you believe to actually avoid these? You really have to do your homework. Um, I, I think it's coming, uh, and, and I'm certainly part of a movement to try to get it. there. If you go on certain key websites, uh, you know, the, the uh, Environmental Working Group in America, for example, uh, and there's lots of other websites that are run by concerned citizens who've had their children poisoned or their children have got cancer and things like that, that they're, they're, they're putting out good science about what is um, safe to eat and what is not safe to eat. I mean, for example, EWG will tell you uh, avoid strawberries and apples. Strawberries have got a lot of fungicide in them and it, it sits below those little seeds on the skin. So even if you rinse the strawberry under water, you don't get rid of the highly toxic fungicide. Um, Apples, for example, they spray the apple with pesticides and then they put a wax coat around it, which keeps them in there. So unless you actually peel the apple, uh, you're going to get a, a fair amount of pesticide from your, from your healthy looking apple. So, I mean, there are tricks like that, which the average consumer doesn't know. But get this, more and more consumers are going to shop at the farmer's market. Organic food sales are doubling worldwide year on year at the moment they're growing at twice the rate of ordinary food sales so somewhere or other consumers are waking up and they may not know the details but they do trust the farmer who who, who comes to the market and says i've grown this without pesticides uh, in a sustainable way so uh, th that's a huge movement it's a huge huge movement in europe it's a it's a big movement in america it's a big movement in australia and new zealand 
Okay, so moving towards sort of practical steps. I mean, we've we've spoken a lot about how bad things are, but I always like to, you know, one of one of the the things that you sort of focus on is the fact that we need to solve these things, and you focus on education. And do you think that the ecological or the focus of education on ecological uh, worries and existential crises, as we're talking about, that actually needs to come before almost anything else in a way. That needs to almost be a separate thing. Well, I wish. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, ecology is is complex stuff. You, know, you try and explain an ecosystem to someone who can't spell the word, and you're you've got it, you're in trouble straight away. I mean, people understand about nature, but they don't really understand how nature works and they don't understand the interrelationships um, of, of living species with one, one with another. So it's a very, it's harder than explaining climate. And most people don't get climate, I have to say. They get the fact that the world is getting hotter and more turbulent, but they don't get the fact how it actually happens. Uh, there's some very complex chemistry behind all of that in physics. So... Um, but I, I guess, you know, you just need people to understand that they need to change their ways and you need to put the right information in their way um, that's accessible to them. And it says it, it provides them with simple rules for life. You know, if I mean, these days we, we often buy our coffee from a fair coffee trader. You know, we, we, we buy our, our, um, our joggers from, a, from a, a firm that doesn't use slave labour in a sweatshop in Asia somewhere, or we, 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 we try to encourage the Bangladeshi garment industry not to kill its workers, and, and, and so forth. You know, so that there's, there's this ethical consumption thing going on in which both people are buying more ethical and sustainable products, but they're also penalising or punishing the companies who produce the bad stuff. And I think it's that carrot and stick that needs to be shown to industry worldwide, to make industry change its ways. We have to reward industry for producing the electric vehicle. That's why we pay a higher price for the electric vehicle now, because we're rewarding industry <clears throat> for being clean and green in the hope that that will transfer a benefit to our grandchildren. Um, so, so, you know, th that's an example. But as we buy more and more electric cars, the price will come down. So in the end, we'll be rewarding ourselves as well. So, uh, you know, I, I think there are lots of ways to do it, but the sources of information, you've got to dig a fair bit to, to find them. It's not easy for the average consumer. You know, right at the beginning, you mentioned that most politicians are just worried about getting elected again. So they really have basically a four-year timescale in which they're going to try and do anything, which means they're not really looking to the, the, the long future, which is what, uh, the far future, which is what you are doing in your book. How, within that current system, can we, you know, form a way of tackling the climate crisis? Yeah, well, <clears throat> there, are, there are kind of two answers there. The situation that we have is that the nation, the nation state, is, in my view, on the skids, right? It's, it's a, an entity that came into being with the end of the Napoleonic era in, in Europe, uh, and we all went, instead of having a feudal system, we went for nation states and republics and things like that. And it's starting to come to an end for various reasons. It's reaching its use-by date. One reason is that, you know, there's a global economy now and individual companies are much more powerful than individual nations. And individual nations, as they lose their power and as their governments lose revenue, can do less and less for their citizens. So we are actually watching or witnessing the crumbling of the model of, of national, you know, the, 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 the national being. Where it's going to all end up, I, I can't tell you because that's a, that's a very fraught question. But nations are having less and less power, less and less say. And as a result, good people are not offering themselves for government any longer. We're, we're getting the second rate and the bottom feeders offering themselves as politicians, the people who want to grub and graft and, uh, you know, and grift and, and basically line their own pockets. There's a great many of those nowadays. You could say that they always did, and to some degree that's true. But, <clears throat> but now I think that it's a specialty. You know, we're not getting people who are in there you know, to, to, to make uh, Britain great or even America great <laughs> again. We're, we're getting people there who just want to rip it off. And, and that's a sign that, you know, 
the nation state has got has got a bad cancer and and it's on its last legs and of course democracy is starting to falter and fail as well as, as we've seen democracies are voting for some incredibly stupid things these days and there's an explanation for that which i can go into um but but democracy basically has lost its way in the western world and that you're now seeing the rise of the east um and and the rise of more aut- autocratic states uh, proportionally so this is all part of the you know the great mix of human politics but it we're no longer like we were in the 20th century or the 19th century these well defined nation states things are starting to fray at the edges so uh, yeah well, why why are we voting for stupid things i mean i'm interested to hear your your idea behind that all oh, right well you won't like it um <laughs> Basically, we produce, us humans, we we produce every year around about 200 billion tonnes of chemical emissions. We produce about 40 or 50 billion tonnes of climate emissions, but 200 billion tonnes of chemical emissions. That's our total chemical outpouring, and it's five times the size of our climate outpouring. Okay, it's huge. It's having an enormous impact on the entire planet. Every single place you look, you can find man-made chemicals. The depths of the ocean, top of Mount Everest, the Antarctic, the Arctic, the polar bears, the penguins, the albatrosses, you can find human chemicals. The stuff that's in your, coming out of your, your lounge suite right now, those flame retardants, is in deep sea squid 3,000 metres down in the, in the Atlantic. How did it get there? So the world is being bathed. In, in toxic chemistry generated by human activity. Okay, now a lot of those chemicals are what they call neurotoxins. They are nerve poisons. They are the same things that go into poison gas, nerve gas, and so on. So and they, these are the things that come out of your couch or that come out of your new car when you inhale that lovely new car smell. Um, they, they, they are all around us mostly as volatile vapours. And the thing about a nerve poison is it has a particularly pernicious effect on a young and developing brain. If you hit a kid at the age of two, three, four, five with a nerve poison, it could be a simple nerve poison like lead, uh, then you can damage that child's IQ by four or five points for life. Okay, and we are seeing that happen. It's documented in thousands of scientific and medical papers. Right. So kids are being brain poisoned all around the world now as a result of the pollution of modern industrial society. They are losing IQ. The world IQ is going down. There's a lot of other things happening. I mean, we're all we're all becoming less fertile as well. Sperm counts are are dropping disastrously around the world in males and males are becoming more feminine. But um, but basically, let's focus on intelligence, because we think of ourselves as an intelligent species, homo sapiens. Um, but our, our IQ is now dropping at around three average of three IQ points per decade. Okay, we've lost 13 and a half IQ points since the mid 1970s. And this is this is based on surveys that have been done in a whole lot of different countries. It's not just one country or a small sample or something like that. So there's more and more evidence that human IQ is now on the way down. And the most likely explanation, the Occam's razor explanation, is our brains are taking an absolute hammering when we're when we're infants. We're being poisoned in actual fact while we're still in the womb. And when we are born straight away, when we we take in our mother's milk, uh, and then as we grow up, we inhale all these fumes from traffic and uh, factories and things like that. It's all around us. It's in the air we breathe. It's in the plastic bottles and the plastic cups that we give our kids, the plastic toys we give our kids, the plastic blankets we put on them at night, the plastic mattress that they sleep on. You know, all of these things are emitting toxic vapors. We absolutely swathe our children in toxicity from the moment they are conceived. Um, and no wonder, you know, we're, we're creating a dumber race, one that doesn't know who to vote for, <laughs> basically, because one that is easily fooled, let's put it that way. Um, so, so that's the undoing of democracy. You cannot have democracy if people are not intelligent enough to analyse the issues. 
right? You'll only have a sheepocracy or something like that. You know, people will just vote for whoever whoever the social media has told them to vote for. The uh, the, the the you know the mind warfare, the psychological warfare gurus of the of, of the political world. So we really have to address this problem of the damage to the human brain caused by industrial uh, and consumer pollution, basically. Okay. Okay. So normally, normally, you know, with these types of episodes, I ask, um, you know, what small practical things could people individually do in their daily lives? But you have a focus on these, you know, big business, but the individuals can affect them. So would one of the things be actually try to remove these toxins from your life? I guess what I'm asking there is, you know, what, what would your advice be to people who do want to begin actually living a, a practically more, more ecologically friendly lifestyle? Yeah, well, for example, a lot of these toxic substances I've, I've just discussed are present in perfumes, soaps, shampoos, all the what we call personal care. I call them personal harm products that you smear on yourself every single day. I mean, the first thing you do in the morning when you wake up is try to get cancer, basically, because you look on your bottle, on your shampoo bottle, there's several, you know, carcinogens in that shampoo. So if you go to the website EWG that I mentioned before, or you could go to the uh, the Breast Cancer Foundation in the United States, there's a whole long list of cosmetics you should not buy because they are toxic. So if you are, if you want to be an informed consumer, these things are available. There are lots of people putting out information now about dangerous products, products that, that have not been tested properly, products that contain known carcinogens and known poisons and so forth. And you can avoid the brands. That that are that, that that threaten you or, or your kids, basically. So, and people are doing this more and more. The information is not perfect. It's spotty. It's piecemeal. It depends what you what what consumer products we're talking about. Um, but it's becoming more and more common now, and, and people are starting to shop on that basis. Um, I, I mean, I know myself. My daughter told me, for my grandchildren, I'm not allowed to buy them plastic toys. Right, I can only buy them wooden toys uh, because seriously, plastic is dangerous stuff, and it's been banned from their household. Uh, and and that she's a scientist, but she she's an advanced thinker about these things. She's an example of the modern consumer who is making a lot of active choices. And there's a heap of companies out there that are now catering to that market and making wooden toys or organic clothing. You know, so th there are lots of people willing to supply that market. And just come back a moment, look what's happening with electric vehicles and look what's happening with solar energy, you know. Those are two areas that were driven by consumers. There's been a, a boom worldwide in demand for clean energy and, and electric cars and electric airplanes soon, electric boats and you name it. So, you know, this is an, a, a clear example where consumers are telling in motor car companies, what they should be producing. So we are not weak and we are not powerless. We get a few hundred million of us together on the internet going for product A and rejecting product B. The company that produces product B is going to wake up with a big start. Okay. Seems very good. Is there anything you would uh, like to add that you, you feel we've missed? No, except to say this is a very serious moment in, a, in our uh, human history. It is the, the greatest existential emergency we've faced in the last one million years. Um, we have established a council for the human future to, uh, to bring to the attention of people and governments and corporations worldwide the nature of the threats and what can be done about them. So we, we believe we can educate you know, humanity and share our knowledge and create a wiser Homo sapiens. Okay. Um, whereabouts can we find your work? Uh, well, my books are all published by different publishers. My my current one, Food or Wars, published by Cambridge University Press. My forthcoming book on the poisoning of the planet uh, is called Earth Detox, and that will be published by Cambridge University Press next year. Um, uh, the uh, Surviving the 21st Century, was published by Springer, the biggest scientific publisher in the world. Um, so, uh, you know, these books are available on Amazon and, and, and places like that. But there are many other writers like myself who are doing the same thing. I, I want to stress that. Uh, I'm, I'm not a lone voice here. 
Uh, I just have a slightly different take from from others. But there's a there's a wealth of this literature available now for people who want to you know create a world in which their grandchildren can survive and thrive. Okay, seems like a good place to finish up. Julian Cripp, thanks very much. Thanks, James. <laughs>